Okay, welcome. Um, this is week four, Trinity term 2021 of the Oxford Philosophy of Physics seminar. This week, it's my great pleasure to welcome Gordon Bellot. Gordon's the Lawrence Sklar Collegiate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Um, he did his PhD in Pittsburgh, after which a postdoc and um, assistant associate professorships in, in Princeton, NYU, and Pittsburgh since. Um, he works on a variety of topics in the philosophy of physics and the philosophy of science more generally, in particular uh, symmetries and in the interpretation of physical theories and issues in scientific reasoning, especially Bayesian reasoning. Uh, and he's the author of Geometric Possibility uh, from 2011, uh, which won the Lakatos Award in 2014 for outstanding contributions to the philosophy of science. Um, so welcome, Gordon. And today he will be talking about the Mark Einstein principle of 1917 to 1918. Excellent. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Adam. Um, so I'm going to share some slides. Um, probably won't surprise you to hear. Um, I'm happy uh, to answer, uh, be interrupted for questions of clarification, but I should say I don't have the bandwidth to look at the chat at all. Um, and so, uh, like, uh, somebody, uh, the person who has the question or somebody else will have to blurt something out to, uh, to, to stop me. Uh, but please do. I think uh, uh, it's much better if people do that. Okay, and now... Okay, yeah. Oh, no. okay. It always does that. Okay, um, yeah, so the uh, the Mach-Einstein principle of 1917 and 1918. So, yeah, I hope that's uh, specific enough. Um, uh, so here's the background to this paper. Um, so I, I'm interested... Uh, maybe you could say obsessed uh, with Einstein's uh, cosmology paper of 1917. So, so it's a very fascinating paper. Um, I mean, one way of thinking of the structure of the paper is uh, Einstein gives an argument uh, for the finitude of space, uh, that space is finite rather than infinite in extension. Um, and then he goes on and presents uh, the first relativistic cosmological model, his uh, eternal and time independent Einstein static universe. And uh, because that solution that he's interested in is not a solution to the original field equations of general relativity, he recommends uh, adding a new term, revising the equations one more time. I mean, it's the equations had been revised a number of times already. It's not like this was completely out of character um, uh, by adding the cosmological constant term. Um, so here's the structure of the argument for spatial finitude. Uh, opening sentence of the paper, he says, we must supplement the differential equations the Einstein field equations, by limiting conditions at spatial infinity, if we really have to regard the universe as being of infinite spatial extent. And then he goes on, okay, you know, there's one obvious set of uh, boundary conditions at spatial infinity that you could supplement the field equations with, namely imposing uh, flatness at spatial infinity, asymptotic flatness uh, for the field equations. Um, but he says, look, that, that just has disastrous consequences. Uh, uh, disasters in three ways. First, uh, you'll violate what at that in the original paper he just calls uh, the principle of relativity, but uh, soon he's calling this principle the principle of general covariance. Um, because you're um, basically choosing preferred frames at infinity. Uh, he also thinks asymptotic flatness would violate Mach's principle uh, for reasons we could talk about later. And he also thinks um, <clears throat> it would make it impossible to have um, a model in, of the universe in which there was a finite amount of matter immersed in otherwise uh, infinite uh, empty space. Uh, so for those three reasons, he says we have to reject asymptotic flatness. But then he also has an argument that uh, he claims shows that there are no other acceptable boundary conditions you can employ and uh, impose instead. And so he concludes, ah, you know, we got into this mess by thinking that space was infinite, so space must be finite. And away he goes. So uh, this paper is sort of part of a, a larger and extremely slowly developing project, um, which is supposed to be a sort of commentary uh, uh, on the paper, a sort of philosophical commentary um, of an unusual sort where, uh, you know, there'll be sort of, for each of the premises on this slide, there'll be a chapter, and each of the chapters will be a sort of mix of um, 
uh, giving Einstein the history of philosophy treatment, even though uh, he wasn't a philosopher and I'm not a historian. Um, and then uh, trying to figure out exactly what he said and why and what was going on in the context where he's writing. But then also um, looking at some of the questions that uh, his original concerns uh, open up out into um, in our contemporary understanding of general relativity. Uh, so uh, that's the kind of talk this is going to be. Uh, I guess it's going to be about uh, premise to be there. Okay, so let's start with uh, the still throat clearing phase. Let's start with uh, two opposed views of what general relativity is all about. So here's this aphorism of Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler. Space tells matter how to move, matter tells space how to curve. So a nice dualistic way of understanding general relativity, probably the dominant way of understanding general relativity among physicists these days. It wasn't Einstein's original way of understanding the theory. So here's a snippet from a letter to Mach of uh, 1913. So before the theory uh, uh, is developed, but while well, it's gestating, let's say. It seems to me absurd to ascribe to ascribe physical properties to space. The totality of masses produces the metric field, which in turn governs the course of all processes, including the propagation of light rays and the behavior of measuring rods and clocks. And so um, the snappier version of this would be matter tells matter, matter, tells matter how to move. Right? It's a monistic uh, way of understanding the theory. Um, so yeah, the talk today is basically about trying to make sense of what Einstein is up to uh, when he's trying to develop this monistic matter tells matter how to move way of understanding the theory. Okay, so here's a sort of official statement of the Mach Einstein principle. Uh, Einstein labels it Mach's principle, but it's not really very similar to anything Mach ever said. So I'm going to call it the Mach Einstein principle. Uh, this is from this famous short paper, which is a reply to Kretschmann of 1918. Um, but it uh, sort of crystallizes something that he's been talking about for a little while before that in his correspondence, ever since the cosmology paper, basically. So this is what Einstein calls Mach's principle. The G field is completely determined by the masses of the bodies. Since mass and energy are, according to the special theory of relativity, the same, and since energy uh, is formally described by the symmetric stress-energy tensor, it follows that the G field is conditioned and determined by the energy tensor of matter. Um, so this is um, this is the official statement of Mach's principle from 1918, but it's been floating around in Einstein's correspondence throughout 1917 and 1918. Later on in 1918, it begins to drop out for um, reasons that may come up. Okay, so some points about this. It's not like anything Mach ever said. There were other Einstein's Mach's principles uh, before 1916 and after 1918. And it's got nothing to do with rotation. Okay, so both before 1916 and 1918, rotation would sometimes have to do with Mach, according to Einstein, but not in this one. Okay, so a way of seeing that it has nothing to do with rotation is to note that um, if you've got uh, a Lorentzian manifold that's a homogeneous solution to the Einstein dust equations with vanishing shear and expansion, then uh, that geometry is either the Einstein static universe or girdle space time, depending on the sign of the cosmological constant. So that's telling you that you can characterize girdle's geometry in terms of the material degrees of freedom. Um, and so it's not going to be a counterexample to this form of Mach's principle although it would be a counterexample to some of the other forms that he entertained before and after uh, he was uh, working with this one. Okay, so um, it's philosophy talk, so let's begin with uh, a distinction uh, between two different uh, forms of Einstein's Mach's principle. Oh, sorry, wrong way. So uh, let's say that the weak Einstein Mach principle is the principle that space-time geometry supervenes on the disposition of matter over time, crucially, not just at an instant, but over time. Now, I know a lot of uh, 
people in philosophy of science hate uh, the concept of supervenience. Uh, so here's a translation of the weak Einstein, uh, Mach Einstein principle into other dialects. Fixing the history of the distribution of matter fixes the space time geometry. That's one way of putting it. Here's another way of putting it. There's only one space time geometry consistent with any given history of matter. That's equivalent. They're all supposed to be equivalent. Or the degrees of freedom of the matter geometry system are exhausted by the material degrees of freedom. And so those are supposed to all be uh, equivalent to the official statement of a, Mach, a weak Mach Einstein principle in terms of supervenience. Einstein had something in mind that was stronger than the weak Mach Einstein principle. So consider one way to specify the disposition, the history of the disposition of matter is to say there's none ever. And it's consistent with the weak principle as stated on the preceding slide, that there be a ground state of the gravitational field that obtains in that case when there's no matter ever. But Einstein thinks that second bullet point is inconsistent with Mach's principle as he understands it. So he intends something stronger. So in his uh, reply to Kretschmann, where, where we're taking his formulation of uh, the Mach-Einstein principle from, he asserts that his original field equations violate Mach's principle because they allow a vacuum solution. Um, this is a sort of interesting uh, period. There's some fine print at the bottom of the slide, and it sort of amounts to um, even though people, you know, Einstein had self-consciously sought um, a theory of gravity that was in many ways analogous to Maxwell's theory, he didn't expect it to have vacuum solutions, or he thought maybe it just had one. And it wasn't just him, Hilbert uh, had the same suspicion. Um, and this suspicion um, survived in the literature for a surprisingly long time. Uh, so there's something uh, interesting going on there about maybe just the role of physical intuition telling them what sort of solutions to expect for these equations when, you know, people look at this now and they're like, ah, it's a generalized wave equation. So of course it has a huge family of vacuum solutions. Okay. And in a, this is just reiterating the point from the preceding slide. In a paper submitted one day later, uh, this paper criticizing De Sitter, he says, if the De Sitter solution were valid everywhere, it would show that the introduction of the lambda term did not fulfill the purpose that I intended. Because in my opinion, the general theory of relativity is, sat is a satisfying theory only if it shows that the physical qualities of space are completely determined by matter alone. Therefore, no metric field must exist without the matter that generates it. Okay, so another very explicit repudiation of the weak form of the Mach-Einstein principle. Um, this thought, uh, can definitely be traced back earlier than 1918. So here's um, a letter to Schwarzschild of 1916. It can be put jokingly this way. If I allow all things to vanish from the world, then following Newton, the Galilean inertial space remains. Following my interpretation, nothing remains. Now, it turned out Einstein really liked this formulation and he stuck with it uh, after the period we're interested in, even when he talked to journalists. Uh, and that's how we get the following uh, headline. Okay, so we want something stronger than the weak Mach Einstein principle. So here's my suggestion. Um, uh, Einstein's Mach principle is something like facts about space time geometry, including the facts about the trajectories of freely falling bodies, etc. Supervene on facts about the distribution of motions of material bodies. That's so far the weak Einstein principle, the weak Mach Einstein principle. And then this add it clause, because the former sort of facts, the geometric facts, are wholly explanatorily dependent on the latter sort of facts. Okay. Now, um, people uh, in Oxford can advise me um, how close uh, the strong Mach Einstein principle is to. Uh, Oxford uh, orthodoxy. Um, I'm not clear on that myself, but uh, I will say that, um, you know, one way you might understand the official statement here of the strong principle is that uh, the geometric facts are causally dependent on the material facts or something like that. 
And I think Einstein is, there's a very strong textual case that I can go into in the question people are interested in, that um, for Einstein, the relevant kind of explanatory dependence was not causal. Okay, and so I think uh, if you're a metaphysician, you'll think, oh, okay, so it's explanatory dependence, it's not causal, so it's grounding. Um, and then you end up with uh, thinking, ah, okay, so the strong Mach Einstein principle is something like be a relationalist about general relativity where relationalism is understood in the sense of Das Gupta, North, or Schaffer. Um, okay. So here's some support for the suggestion that he has in mind something like the explanatory dependence thing. So there's the, the letter to Mach that we already talked about, plus there's a couple of interesting passages from 1920. So this is from a letter to Schlick. According to the general theory of relativity, this has reality, but not an independent one. And then those properties are fully determined by matter. This is like very similar to the kind of careful skating around ontological questions that Leibniz sometimes engages in. And he'll say like something like, ah, space and time are real things, but ideal. Um, so yeah, it's a real thing, uh, but not an independently real thing. It's, it, it's real, but it depends on something else uh, because its properties are fully determined by that something else. Or uh, here's a passage from an unpublished uh, set of notes that he wrote. In relativity theory, space and ether is by no means homogeneous and its state has no independent existence, but rather depends upon the field generating matter. Since the metric facts can no longer be separated in the new theory from the physical facts proper, the concepts of space and ether flow into each other. Since the properties of space appear to be conditioned by matter, space is no longer a precondition for matter in the new theory. The theory of space geometry can no longer be treated before or developed independently of mechanics and gravitation. Okay, so I'm just going to assume that he has something more like the strong uh, principle in mind, although um, uh, a lot of what we're going to do, uh, what I'm going to talk about in the following won't really depend on that because uh, a lot of it will just be about the supervenience question. Um, so natural question you might have if you're uh, living in 1918 or if you're living now is uh, does general relativity satisfy the strong Mach Einstein principle or the weak Mach Einstein principle? Um, so I want to say a little bit about uh, that question. So you, um, first, a methodological point about general talk, asking questions like this about general relativity. There are almost always counterexamples to any substantive interesting claim about general relativity. I mean, think about um, you know cosmic censorship or something. Um, uh, turns out there, there are counterexamples, and then the question is like, how wide is the field of counterexamples? How contrived are they? Uh, you know, how central to um, uh, modeling, our interest in modeling like realistic systems are, are the counterexamples, things like that. So I think this is like yeah, a general thing is, uh, ra you know, rather than, it turns out not to be that hard to settle the question uh, does every single solution satisfy this principle? Um, more interesting question is how uh, interesting is the class of counterexamples? Um, so I'm going to give some counterexamples, uh, but I don't think that settles the interesting question. Okay, so let's have some warm up. Let's think about Mach's, uh, Maxwell's theory instead. How would this look in Maxwell's theory? So instead of asking whether uh, the geometry is determined by the history of massive matter, you ask whether um, uh, the Maxwell field is determined by the history of charged matter. Uh, so the electromagnetic Mach Einstein principle, the disposition over time of discrete charged matter determines the electromagnetic field. So I think little uh, discrete charges moving around in space. Warning, um, Einstein himself was no fan of this. So this is a kind of like interesting fact about Einstein. Um, in the same period that he was a great fan of um, sort of reducing facts about space-time geometry to facts about uh, particulate masses, he was very against reducing facts about the M Maxwell field to facts about charge masses. Um, because uh, on the electromagnetic side, what he really wanted to do was find an alternative to Maxwell's theory where um, stable charges were 
complicated long-lived field configurations at the micro level. Okay, so Maxwell's theory with discrete matter, famously thorny uh, uh, thing to set up. So let's uh, just make a stipulation. We're going to be interested in an approach that is uh, mathematically well-behaved, even though physically it's a little silly. So uh, we can get a well-behaved theory with that includes self-interactions of the charged matter with itself via the field uh, by following Abraham. So we work with extended uh, charged particles uh, that are rigid spheres in a preferred frame. Okay, so not relativistic, uh, but otherwise well-behaved. And now it's obvious, right, that uh, the supervenience of the electromagnetic field on the history of charged matter fails uh, because it fails completely already in the vacuum case. If there's no charged matter, there's lots of different ways the field can be. Um, so the supervenience fails. But, um, you know, like a real fan of uh, the electromagnetic Mach Einstein principle isn't going to be very dismayed um, by the failure of the supervenience in the vacuum case. They consider the vacuum case a kind of wild fantasy where, um, you know, somehow there's an electromagnetic field, even though there's no charged matter to give rise to it. It doesn't even make any sense. Right? So uh, they'll say like, yeah, let's set the vacuum case aside and focus on the case with at least one charge. So, you know, the very simplest thing we could consider is a single charge sitting there at rest in the preferred frame. Um, and uh, it's plausible that there's only one field configuration uh, consistent with a single charge just sitting there, namely the field's standard external Coulomb field, uh, the, the particle's standard external Coulomb field. So why is this plausible? Well, think, look, the external field of this charge that's just sitting there has to be either spherically symmetric or not. If it isn't spherically symmetric, then presumably at some point, um, the charge is going to feel that. Right? So any any disturbance in the external field that isn't spherically symmetric, like eventually that's going to propagate over and hit the charge. And at that point, the charge is going to jiggle. Uh, but we, we said the charge is at rest. So plausibility argument rules out the possibility of the exterior field being not spherically symmetric. But if the exterior field is spherically symmetric, then uh, the only possibility is the external Coulomb field. So there's a sort of electromagnetic analog of Birkhoff's theorem. So, you know, if you can fill in uh, the details basically in point one there, then you'll have a proof that the electromagnetic Mach Einstein principle holds in the simplest possible case involving uh, matter. And if it doesn't hold, uh, because there's some surprising way of evading uh, point one, then the fan of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic Mach Einstein principle is going to have to try to handle that by resorting to a little theft by adding a postulate that rules out those kinds of fields. Okay, so this is kind of um, a preview of the kind of dialectic that we'll have in general activity. Um, plausibility argument, ah, if it works, that's great. If it doesn't, um, well, we can always um, make some stipulation about the content of the theory that tries to make that counterexample go away. Okay, so let's go back to general relativity. So the vacuum case is just as straightforward, right? One way to specify the history of massive matter is to say that there's none ever anywhere. And this is consistent with many different uh, space-time geometries. So this is something some that Einstein and Hilbert didn't realize, but which is true, there's a lot of uh, vacuum solutions. So the Mach-Einstein principle fails, unless we're willing to say that uh, all of these vacuum geometries are unphysical or maybe all but one of them if we're happy with the weak form of the Mach Einstein principle. Um, and again, like this isn't going to be necessarily super costly for the fan of the Mach Einstein principle since um, you know we we do use vacuum solutions to model physical situations in our universe. Um, but we really hope that that use is in principle eliminable since uh, our, our, you know, our universe does include matter, it had better be uh, 
that general relativity has realistic solutions in which we could uh, provide a better model with the with, with some matter and whatever was going on in otherwise empty space that we were interested in. Okay, what about beyond the vacuum case in general relativity then? Well, uh, the first substantive test for the Mach Einstein principle comes in the one body case, obviously. And the natural place to start is with a static isolated body in the lambda equals zero case, so no cosmological constant. Uh, and here uh, we can do some things. So consider a static isolated blob of perfect fluid with constant mass density rho and total mass m. If the exterior metric is static and asymptotically flat at spatial infinity, then the blob has to be a sphere. Uh, that's one theorem. And then second theorem, the exterior metric has to be Schwarzschild. So there's no ambiguity in what the exterior looks like as long as um, we know that it's static and asymptotically flat at spatial infinity. Here's a trickier thing you can do. Uh, so this uh, involves elastic bodies. So work first in the G equals zero case, so special relativity. Specify a compact elastic body in equilibrium in Euclidean space. Then for sufficiently small values of uh, the gravitational constant, there will be a unique static space-time that's asymptotically flat at spatial infinity and vacuum exterior to an elastic body that represents the given one as deformed by the presence of gravity. Okay, so this is um, uh, a quite tricky thing to do. I mean, to uh, I, th I think it's quite a tricky thing to have thought of in the first place, and then quite tricky to actually um, uh, prove that all this works, but it does. So the game is something like, ah, if I know there's uh, an elastic uh, equilibrium configuration in, in with no gravity, then I also know that if I turn gravity on at least uh, to a small amount of gravity, the, there'll be a unique uh, deformation of the original configuration that represents the self gravitation of the, the elastic body. And uh, as long as I'm happy imposing, uh, requiring that the exterior be static and asymptotically flat, then um, there's also a unique exterior for it. Okay, so the moral is that if we're able to prove or willing to stipulate that the geometry exper uh, exterior to an isolated body must be asymptotically flat and have the same symmetries as the body, then the Mach-Einstein principle holds for certain sorts of isolated bodies in general relativity. So let's set aside for today because it's um, the topic of another uh, uh, paper in this project, uh, whether this, the field equations imply that the geometry exterior to a static isolated body must be asymptotically flat. In fact, the field equations don't imply that, but let's not talk about that today. Let's focus instead on the symmetries. Okay, so, um, so here's a thought. Plausibly, the geometry exterior to a spherically symmetric body should be spherically symmetric. Otherwise, wouldn't the body eventually feel um, the lack of symmetry in the exterior geometry? And plausibly, for the same reason, um, the geometry exterior to a static body should be static, right? If the, if we know the hist the body is static, sits there forever, um, it seems like the exterior geometry has to be static because otherwise wouldn't wouldn't the body feel it? That's that's the thought. Um, okay, so I'm going to get to some counterexamples in a minute, but I experience has taught me when I'm giving this talk that um, in person, where people don't have to interrupt me through the chat that I don't read, that um, people get very restless uh, during the preceding section because there's something that they want to say about how general relativity works. Uh, they really, really want to get to it. So here it is. Um, uh, so, well, later in his life, Einstein um, 
uh, probably a lot of you already know, Einstein renounced Locke's principle uh, for various reasons in the 1950s. So here's a recollection of uh, Dennis Shama, uh, who visited him one week before he died. And uh, yeah, so here's Shama. To help ease my tension, I started the discussion with a prepared sentence. Professor Einstein, I would like to talk about Mach's principle, and I have come to defend your former self against your later self. Like, uh, luckily, he laughed uproariously and said, yeah, that, that is good, yeah. Okay. Um, so what was it that the later Einstein thought about Mach, the Mach's principle and about the earlier Einstein that Shama wanted to defend? Uh, this is, I think it's made, the, the point Einstein wants to make is made most clearly in this uh, letter to Felix Pirani. There's a parallel passage in his intellectual autobiography, but it's um, a little hard to interpret on its own. And the thought is spelled out, I think, more explicitly in this letter. So I can give you three snippets from it. The second one is the one that's actually crucial for me. Um, so according to Einstein, when he's writing to Pirani, Mach sought to abolish space and replace it by the relative mutual inertia of ponderable bodies. This certainly did not work. So he's picturing here a theory in which, um, you know, as, Mach under, as Einstein understands what Mach was calling for uh, to replace Newton's mechanics, it was something like uh, a theory with some point particles interacting uh, instantaneously at a distance. That certainly did not work, Einstein says. Okay, then he carries on. But he's like, yeah, but that's not really what people think today when they're talking about Mach's principle. What, when people today talk about Mach's principle, they don't mean to abolish uh, the continuum, but to preserve the field. Okay, so they're not trying to move to a point particle thing. They're gonna hold on to um, the metric field or something, but they think that the field ought to be completely de determined by the matter. Okay, so this is like, does sound like an accurate report of what young Einstein thought, or you know, really middle-aged Einstein, 1918 Einstein. Einstein, late Einstein continues, this is, however, a ticklish affair. Um, since the stress energy tensor, which is supposed to represent matter, also presupposes the metric tensor. Okay, so this is um, uh, this is the thing that um, probably m m many of you may well have been worried about so listening to this uh, talk up till now. Is like, yeah, but it doesn't really make any sense because the stress energy tensor isn't something that we can specify independently of the metric. Uh, uh, you know, like even um, the stress energy tensor for dust or something um, involves normalized uh, uh, velocity vectors for the dust. And there, you use the metric tensor to do the normalization. Okay, Einstein continues. In my opinion, we, not, we ought not to speak about the Machian principle anymore. It proceeds from the time in which one thought that ponderable bodies were the only physical reality and that all elements that could not be fully determined by them ought to be avoided in the theory. I am well aware that for a long time, I too was influenced by this idée fixe. So um, yeah, you can sort of read this one as, uh, yeah, I used to be, I used to have this monistic view of what general relativity should be. Matter tells matter how to move. That was wrong, we need to have a dualistic view. But it's the second one I want you to focus on, and in particular, um, the idea that matter presupposes the metric. Okay, so the idea is something like um, um, there's a presupposition failure when you ask whether uh, the matter determines the geometry. It's like asking whether the king of France is bald. Okay, so here's, um, I think, I think. This is Einstein's uh, point, just re-expressed by Jürgen Ehlers. Um, if people think there's some sleight of hand here, uh, they should definitely object. But I think uh, Jürgen Ehlers is uh, just restating Einstein's point here. If you have a stress energy tensor and not a metric, then this does not meaningly describe matter. There's no theory of physics so far which can describe matter without already the metric as an ingredient of the description of matter. Therefore, within existing theories, the statement that the matter by itself determines the metric is neither wrong nor false, but it is meaningless. Okay, so I think that final part is spelling out uh, the consequence 
of Einstein's idea that the stress energy tensor presupposes the metric. Okay, so here's what I think the worry is, right? Start with the observation that matter enters the field equations only through the stress energy tensor. And then note um, that to say that the matter determines the space-time geometry is to say there's only one metric consistent with a given stress energy tensor. Ah, but the stress energy tensor depends on the space-time metric as well as the variables describing the matter content. So in general relativity, it makes no sense to speak of some way that matter, uh, of some way that matter might be, sorry, to speak of some way that matter might be distributed as determining or failing to determine the geometry of space-time. So uh, this is um, my best attempt to spell out uh, the line of argument. And there are rejoinders. So first of all, I mean, obviously, because of the vacuum case, the argument isn't sound, right? In the vacuum case, it makes sense because it is false to say that the empty distribution of matter determines the space-time metric. More generally, above, you know, in the sort of preceding subsection, we saw some tricks for specifying the matter distribution that don't involve specifying the stress energy tensor and which do not seem to require that the space-time metric has been specified in advance. Now, you may think um, that's a fishy thing to say. Uh, what do I mean by saying, ah, oh, I've got a blob with this mass uh, and this density uh, if I don't have a metric? Well, uh, think of it this way. I can say that there's a blob of incompressible fluid of a given total mass and density without having first specified a space-time metric because my claim that I have a, a blob with that mass and that density makes sense in either Newtonian physics or in general relativity. So it can't be that I needed to specify the metric in order to get you to know what I was talking about when I said uh, the blob had a certain mass and a certain density. Okay, is it really the same properties in both cases? I don't know. Um, uh, I, think it's a, I think it's enough that we have properties here that are either identical or play the same functional operational roles. Um, so I, I, I stick with what I'm saying at the third bullet point, even if uh, there's a sense in which it's a different notion of mass in the two theories. That's fine with me, so long as you agree that, yes, um, you know, in both cases, we're going to measure uh, uh, what this mass is by having something orbited and, uh, uh, you know, keeping track of the orbital uh, frequency or something like that. Okay. Even if you don't all, you should like the stuff, everything that happened on the preceding slide, but if for some reason you don't, here's a fallback position. Um, the worst case would be uh, we can't specify the state of matter without also specifying the geometry of that part of space time occupied by matter. Even in this case, it would lead us with a sort of substantive question that the Mach Einstein principle was directing our attention towards, even if it wasn't exactly uh, what Einstein had in mind. Because it would be a substantive question whether there's ever more than one inextendable vacuum exterior solution consistent with uh, a given way of specifying, you know, the interior solution, the geometry and matter in the part occupied by matter. Um, uh, it's definitely not a trivial question. Um, uh, so there's still something left, even if you don't buy everything on the preceding slide, which of course you should. Okay, so let's get to the counterexamples. Um, how am I doing on time, Adam? How long should I, when should I stop? Uh, you got about 20 minutes if you, if you want to. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 I don't think it'll be 20. Um, good. Uh, but I won't rush through the counterexamples then. Okay. So I'm going to give two counterexamples. Uh, the first one is going to involve, um, positive cosmological constant. So recall that in order to construct his eternal time independent spatially finite cosmology, Einstein added the cosmological constant term to the equations. And you know what he wanted to do, you know, he wanted there, he wanted there to be a three sphere full of, uh, massive matter distribute homogeneously. And he wanted that to be a stable configuration that was didn't change over time. Now, obviously on its own, the, the matter would want to contract into a more dense configuration. Einstein didn't want that to happen. So he added the cosmological constant term whose job was to counter that tendency towards collapse. 
Um, now, what happens if you look for a vacuum solution with a cosmological constant, right? Now there's no matter uh, to give you a collapsing tendency. There's only the cosmological constant whose tendency is towards expansion. And so this is exactly what de Sitter found. It's what Einstein was complaining about in that quote about de Sitter uh, uh, at the beginning of the talk. There's a very uh, complicated history about um, Einstein's, um, basically Einstein and Weil both thought uh, de Sitter's uh, empty solution contains singularities, which it doesn't. Um, eventually de Sitter and Klein convinced them of that. Here's a picture of you know, a sort of uh, two-dimensional version of de Sitter space-time. So it's basically, you take Minkowski space-time, you pick a point, then you look at all um, points at one unit, let's say, of space-like separation from the origin. You get this one-sheeted hyperboloid. Uh, that's de Sitter space-time in two dimensions. Um, so, uh, you know, if you sort of, uh, you can think of it as, uh, if we sliced it into instants of time uh, by taking horizontal cross sections of it, you think three of them are shown here. What happens is it starts out arbitrarily large in the infinite past, shrinks down at an exponential rate to reaches a minimum, and then expands again towards the future. So unchecked, the cosmological constant will lead to an exponential spatial expansion. Now, Einstein thought that by adding the cosmological constant, he was bolstering uh, the Mach-Einstein principle. But in fact, adding the cosmological constant makes it much easier to find counterexamples to the Mach-Einstein principle. So in the lambda equals zero case, we have a kind of, kind of convincing argument that um, a single isolated body um, static, um, that there should only be one possible exterior solution to that. So the Mach-Einstein principle is fine in that case. Uh, but it turns out for the corresponding problem with positive lambda, uh, a spherically symmetric perfect fluid star admits more than one extendable, inextendable exterior geometry. So here's a picture. Um, it contains two stars, this space time. So, uh, the dark gray regions are um, uh, spherically symmetric static regions containing matter. Everything else is vacuum. Um, in uh, these regions here, uh, regions one and four, the space-time geometry is static, uh, but it's not static in regions two and three. So this is an Einstein, uh, sorry, uh, a de Sitter Schwarzschild solution. So. It's basically the positive cosmological constant version of Schwarzschild space-time, where we've sewn together an interior Schwarzschild solution, the matter-filled region, and an exterior Schwarzschild solution, the vacuum region. Uh, so the Cauchy surfaces here, like think of the horizontal cross-sections are gonna have topology of a three-sphere. The exterior space-time is Schwarzschild de Sitter, so basically uh, uh, looks like de Sitter, except when you're close to the matter, then it looks more like uh, uh, Schwarzschild. Uh, regions two and three undergo exponential expansion and contraction. So note, footnote there, but sort of important. Um, the lambda, the positive lambda field equations do not imply that the geometry exterior to a static body must be static, even in a spherically symmetric case. So there's this temptation that I was trading on earlier to think like, oh, well, if you've got some static configuration, the exterior would have to be static. Maybe that's true with lambda equals zero, definitely not true with positive lambda. And um, we could, if we want it to, if you're unhappy with the fact that there's two stars here, which is a kind of oddity of the positive lambda world, you could uh, you know, take, cut it into horizontal slices and then uh, quotient by the reflection symmetry uh, across this vertical line here that I'm trying to draw. And then you would get something with just one star and spatial slices with more topology. Okay, so that's one solution. Here's another solution with the same matter configuration but different overall geometry. Um, what's going on here is uh, star, static region, expanding region, contracting region, 
static region, static region, uh, expanding black hole, white hole. Right? In fact, we could so to get we could interpolate between this star and this star any number of black holes that we want. And if we're going to do the quotient thing, then what we end up with is um, you know a single star with uh, I guess zero black holes, a half black hole, one and a half black holes, two and a half black holes, and so on. Um, anyway, the main point is uh, this is a counterexample to the Mach Einstein principle. So this diagram and this diagram, we have the same spatial geometry. Uh, sorry, the same geometry within the. We have the same material configuration and different overall space-time geometries. Okay, here's another counterexample. This is in the lambda equals zero setting, where we give up on. Uh, we're still working with a single bottle, uh, a single body. It's still spherically symmetric, but we give up on the requirement that the body be static. So here's the simplest model of collapse. We have a collapsing uh, ball of fluid surrounded by vacuum. We're going to write. To, we're going to impose some initial data, and we're going to require that it be uh, time reversal symmetric. So basically, I mean, the way to do this is to just make it so that um, uh, the particles of fluid are all at rest um, at t equals zero when we impose the data. And then, you know, in the central region region of this uh, initial data slice, we're going to have a homogeneous sphere of fluid. And then in the exterior region, we're going to just have a slice of ordinary Schwarzschild geometry, exterior Schwarzschild geometry. So what's going to happen with this initial data? Well, for positive T, it's going to look like you'd expect. We're going to start with this ball of fluid at rest. And as T goes to infinity, it's going to collapse. But eventually, uh, it's going to collapse uh, behind an event horizon and form uh, a black hole. And then the matter will disappear. For t, as t goes to minus infinity, we get the time reverse of that. So um, we get a past eternal vacuum with a white hole. But the white hole is destroyed when it emits an expanding ball of fluid. The ball of fluid then expands. Uh, slower and slower until it comes to rest and then begins contracting again forms a black hole. Um, so that's going to be our basic uh, solution and then we're going to try to cook up another solution that has the same matter but different geometry. Here's how we're going to do it. So here's the solution I just described. Right, so it's got a white hole at the bottom and a black hole at the top. Um, I haven't drawn the event horizon but here is um, the world tube of the ball of fluid. So here it is at its maximum size, uh, shrinks down there, expands that way. And then here's my initial data slice, sigma zero. The red part is the matter filled part, and the black part is exterior Schwarzschild. So some points on sigma zero uh, can send signals. Uh, to the fluid body before it disappears into the whole, uh, into the singularity. And right? so, uh, this point, uh, I can send a light signal that reaches uh, the fluid body. I don't care where the event horizon is. Uh, maybe it's already behind it. That's fine. Still, the the signal is received by the matter. Um, but there are other points on the initial data slice that are so far away from uh, the ball of fluid at this time that any light signal that they send uh, will not reach the body. Instead, the light signal will go directly into the black hole. So we can divide uh, the exterior region of our initial data slice into two portions. So we've got, we already have the red portion, that's the matter part. Now we're interested in the exterior part to its right. The green part is the, uh, the points on the initial data service that can send signals to the body, and the blue part is the point on the initial data surface that cannot send signals to the body. And our goal is to create a new initial data set on sigma zero uh, that matches the given one in the red and green regions, but differs in the blue region. 
This will determine a space-time geometry with the same matter configurations before, but with different geometry near uh, spatial and null infinity. Okay, so the point here is uh, we're going to mess with what's going on out here. It won't make any difference to this whole region here. Right? No signal from here can reach this region. But this region determines the matter geometry. So we'll end up with a space-time that's different from the given one, but only in a way that cannot affect the matter. Now, I want to say it's not totally obvious that we can do this. Um, so we can't, for instance, just say, oh, OK, yeah, whatever. So this is all you know, interior Schwarzschild initial data, exterior Schwarzschild initial data. Now just have like some little transition zone and just like so on Minkowski initial data here. That's illegal uh, because of the positive energy theorem. Okay, so there are substantive constraints to what kind of geometry we can sew onto this region, given what's happening over here. This is an interesting thing about general relativity, uh, the constraint equations on initial data uh, encode uh, interesting physics. Okay, so it's not obvious that we can do this, but we can do it. So there's uh, a gluing technique uh, due to, I'll say, crucial, but I, uh, people who know how to pronounce Polish names can tell me what I sh should have said, and delay which allows us to pose asymptotically flat initial data on the blue region uh, whose development is non-static. Right? And the fact that it's non-static tells you that what you get when you evolve that initial data cannot be spherically symmetric, because Kirchhoff's theorem tells you that if you have a spherically symmetric vacuum solution, it has to be static as well. So now we have a vacuum exterior for a lambda equals zero spherically symmetric isolated body that is not spherically symmetric. Um, so that's a counter example to another one of our ideas about symmetry that, oh, if it wasn't spherically symmetric, then if the exterior field wasn't spherically symmetric, then the body would eventually feel it. In this case, the body does not feel it because the body has disappeared before uh, the non-spherically symmetric disturbance has time to reach it. Um, And so the space-time geometry uh, that corresponds to the second initial data set is definitely not the same as the space-time geometry corresponding to the first initial data set, even though they have the same material uh, uh, region. And so counterexample to the Mach-Einstein principle in the lambda equals zero case. Notice it was more work than it was in the positive lambda case. Um, so it's like sort of irony that um, uh, Einstein thought adding lambda would be good for the Mach-Einstein principle, but it turns out it's, it just makes it easier to find counterexamples. Okay, so um, that's basically what I wanted to say. I wanted to just close by highlighting some questions that I think are worth thinking about. So first, um, you know, what does Einstein's Mox principle require beyond mere supervenience? So I made this sort of stipulation about explanatory dependence or something, but um, I think it's definitely underdetermined by the texts and it would be interesting to think more about um, uh, what's going on in Einstein and what he probably had in mind uh, about this uh, and also about what might plausibly uh, which principles in the area might be most plausible. Okay I also did a lot of hand waving when I talked about the electromagnetic version. I think it'd be uh, interesting to investigate whether um, the electromagnetic version of the Mach Einstein principle is a consequence of the uh, Maxwell Abraham theory. So, I mean, I did at one point ask um, people who worked on mathematicians who worked on this theory whether they knew uh, the answer, and they didn't. But, I mean, it wasn't a kind of question that they were uh, very motivated to, that had any natural motivation in the way they were thinking about the theory. Um, in general relativity, what are the acceptable ways of specifying the material degrees of freedom? upon which the geometric degrees of freedom are supposed to supervene. So I was claiming that uh, I was allowed to talk about the mass and density of a fluid star, uh, that that was an acceptable way of trying to specify information about the material configuration. And whether or not you agree about that example, there's an interesting question here about uh, what is legitimate. Um, and then, like, big question, uh, you know, what kinds of counterexamples are there to the Mach-Einstein principle beyond the regime of static isolated bodies. Um, in particular, I mean, both of the kinds of examples, uh, counterexamples that I gave involved 
global structures for space-time that would have surprised Einstein and his contemporaries um, exploiting uh, black holes in the well in both cases. Um, so yeah, it's you know the the the, the sort of move from ah, symmetry in the matter to symmetry in the exterior that sounds plausible can be circumvented by putting in surprising global features. Um, I'd like to know more about uh, what the possibilities are when you're talking about more than just one body. Uh, and finally, um, can a static body emit exteriors with distinct asymptotic behaviors at spatial infinity? So I think I know the answer to that one, but I also think um, it's the kind of case where it'd be good to know. I think the, the answer is yes, but it would be good to know more about the range of counterexamples. Um, great. Okay. So those are my questions and uh, that's all I had to say. So thanks very much.